Okay, folks. Thank you for sending me your uh, summaries. And uh, I'm, of course, the projects were due anyway at 10.30. I timed the email to go out at 10.25 with the presentation and my and the Excel spreadsheet. So it should have come in. Um, and I don't think you can, re you know, five minutes, you're not going to be able to redo your project and resubmit it anyway. So I, I timed it just right. But I did it too early. Um, I think I got 29 of the group numbers before 9.30, which is when I had to get the presentation done. I got four more after that, and I'm going to, I, I'm going to put them into the, my final presentation, but they did not show, they won't show up in the graphs and stuff. Now, who's in the lab time group? Are you guys playing to stereotypes? You are the last group to submit. It's almost like we're going to show you that in Latin America, we never do anything just until it's just on time. Now, it is on time. I got it. Thank you. But your numbers are not in the in the graphs because they came in a little too late for me to include them. But I know what your conclusion is anyway. Right? Now, before I do this, the, this presentation, there are a couple of things I want you to promise me. Don't freak out. That's my the first thing I'm going to ask you. What I mean by that is when you see a number up there and it doesn't match your number and you say, oh my God, the world has ended. I'm going to get a zero. Just let it go. Trust me to give you credit. I mean, if you've added an extra zero somewhere and it's a numerical error and you get this, you know, you add another, you know, it, it does matter in terms of numbers because 29.9 billion and 299 billion different numbers. But if that's what it was, I'll find the mistake. I'll probably take a half a point off. I think a you know, $270 billion mistake at least deserves a half a point. But there will be things where I'm going to use the case as a launching pad to talk about things in valuation and corporate finance. So what I'd like you to take out of this is not the Tesla bot solution, but what you can learn about this for any kind of capital budgeting and valuation. So let's, let's cut to the chase. So let's, let me start off by showing you my numbers. And I'm going to emphasize the word my because there is a degree of discretion I left you and it was intentional. And it frustrated some of you. So why doesn't he give us this extra information? Because in real life, not everything is specified. You get to make choices. And I wanted to see what choices you made to see if those choices reflected what I... So let me start with, with a sum in the project. Before I do that, though, 
there's one thing about the case that some of you wrestle with, which is time. Year one, year two, you're saying, when does year one start? And I try to be as specific as possible that right now is time zero, then year one is the next year. And we are playing games here, right? Because numbers don't come in at the end of the year. They occur over the course of the year. This is for convenience that we assume that cash flows happen at the end of the year. Hopefully none of you got stuck on that saying mid-year conventions, but essentially year one, year two, year three are starting today, the next year, two years from now, three years from now, et cetera. Okay? So we live in a continuous world, but numbers, you know, the numbers we're using, we act like it's a discrete world where everything happens once a year for convenience. So let me first give you what I found by looking at the numbers for the case. This is a project. And remember the point we made about discount rates for projects is so the discount rate for a project, somebody finished the sentence should reflect what? The risk of the project, not the risk of the company, not the risk of you know something else you're looking at, the risk of the project. And in this case, the Tesla bot project, I looked at the industrial machinery data that, that I gave you. And you might disagree with that being the right choice for it, but I could not find anything that was close to it because it's a business to business business. You're selling to other companies. And based on at least my estimates, the cost of the beta that I ended up with for this project was 0.96. The cost of equity is 11.10%. And the cost, of, don't, the, let the freak out stop right now because already you're saying my cost of capital was 15%, 9%. Just let it go for the moment. When I go through the process, maybe we can talk about why there might be differences in the cost of capital. So that was the cost of capital I used for the Tesla bot project. I did compute an accounting return, but I'll be quite honest. And this might be something you spent a lot of time on and it's a little unfair that I made you go through it. I just made the quickest assumptions I could and got through my return on capital. You know why? Because I knew I wasn't going to use that as the basis for my decision. So view that as a general proposition. When you have a number that you're computing, because it has to be computed, it's, your, your decision is not going to be based on why waste your time on decisions on 20-year depreciation versus 10-year, how to allocate things. It'll affect your accounting return on capital but your decision is not driven by it. Of course, if your decision is going to be driven by the return on capital, by all means, spend more time. My return on capital was between 19 and 24%, depending on what I assumed about start of the year, end of the year, average numbers, whether I included working capital, whether I included the expansion investment. So between nine, but the reason I leave it as a range is that range is still higher than my cost of capital. So from an accounting perspective, the project actually looks pretty good. When I computed the net present value, everything got inverted. First, I computed the net present value of the project without the synergy. So I took the expected cash flows and I'll go through that process. And my net present value with a 10 year life was minus 6 billion. And even when I included the synergy, it was still minus 3.7 billion. That is in the finite life case. So I got a big negative net present value. When I lengthened the life of the project, and this is where I think we're gonna see the biggest difference between what you found and I found. My net present value stayed negative. In fact, it didn't improve that much. And if you think about the numbers you turned in, and I'll show you how much your net present values increased when you went from a 10 year life to a forever life. And we'll talk about why that might be happening. Mine didn't change very much. A bad project over 10 years doesn't magically become a great project just because you lengthen it up if you're being consistent in your assumptions. Now on the synergy front, I did estimate the software synergies, but I did use a different cost of capital. And, and if you did not do it, it's again, something I'm not taking points off, but something to think about is when you create synergies for a different business, the cash flows are in that business, the discount rate should reflect the discount rate for that business. And because it's a much riskier business, it does affect the net present value. I got $2.3 billion as the value of synergy in the finite life case, 10 years. But when I extended the life and assumed the software synergies would continue, it was $3.5 billion. Incidentally, did I ever use the words perpetual life in the case? I just said longer life, right? So in a sense, I gave you the freedom to decide whether to go an extra 10, extra 15 or forever. 
Now, I use it forever, but I had qualms about doing it because of the kind of business this is. The reason being it's a technology business, a software business. Those are businesses with short life cycles. Assuming forever might be an extremely dangerous assumption. So I'll talk about what happens if I go just another 10 years or 15 years rather than forever. For, for me, the difference was very minor. And we'll talk about what assumptions I'm making that lead me to that. My bottom line is that even though this looks like a big business, after grinding through the numbers, I would not accept the investment. You guys almost split down the middle. 18 groups suggested accepting the project. 14 groups suggested rejecting the project. So I look at the net present values you came up with and what the decision might have been based on, but it's almost halfway done. And I, I don't intend to do this when I start the case, but to me, this is actually the best outcome when I write a case is you get the split down the middle. Because when you get 32 accepts and zero rejects, what's to discuss, right? You're just discussing little points of order. So let me go through the cost of capital calculation. First, to get the beta for this project, I looked at other firms in the robotics business or the machinery business. I estimated a median regression beta and a median debt to equity ratio. Already, I'm going to talk about why you might get a different beta. Here, I get the regression beta for the sector, the debt to equity, and I unlevered the number. What's the other way you could have done this? Some of you did this. You don't even remember what you did. You unlevered each company's beta and you took a median unlevered beta. Technically, I mean, there's no reason you can't do that. Statistically, I prefer to just compute the numbers for the sector first and unlevering once rather than unlevering each company's beta. You get a slightly lower beta if you take the unlevered beta for each company and take the median unlevered beta, somewhere between 0.86 and 0.9. So if you got lower beta, it's probably because you unlevered every company's beta and use that median unlevered beta. But I'm staying with that beta. I apply the debt to equity ratio for Tesla and it has almost no debt. Here, let me pause. When you do debt to equity for levering and unlevering betas, you have two choices, right? You can go with book debt and book equity, which is in the balance sheet. Or you can go with market debt and market equity, which is not in the balance sheet. Market equity, you've got to go look at the market price, multiply by the number of shares. Market debt, I, I kind of made your life easier by saying, assume that book debt is pretty close to market debt. But which one should you use when you unlever and relever betas, book or market? And tell me why. Because you're going to get into this argument, but somebody at work says, why shouldn't I use book debt to equity? What is it about betas and cost to capital? Both those cases, we use market values. Why, why do we use market values? It's the cost of funding the business today. If you go out and raise equity today and raise debt today, you're not issuing them, I hope, at book values because that'd, that'd be an incredible bargain. If you're buying shares at Tesla at book value, you're doing it at market value. If you use book debt to equity, is the ratio going to be lower or higher? My market debt to equity is like 0.9%. What do you think of book debt to equity? Did any of you use book debt to equity? Yeah. What do you end up with as a book debt? A much higher debt to equity ratio. It is going to make your levered beta higher, but it'll make your cost of capital lower. So one reason you might end up with a lower cost of capital is if you use a book debt ratio in both places, you're going to end up with a lower cost of capital. And remember what I said about you know, some accountants saying, we use book values because we want to be conservative. And I said, that doesn't make sense. This is precisely why, because it lower your cost of capital, make good projects look better than they really should be. So it's market debt to equity. The levered beta I end up with is, uh, based on that is 0.96, and the cost of equity and cost of capital are computed based on the same debt ratio. And your debt is making almost no difference to your cost of capital. It's 0.9% and 99%. Incidentally, I did give you the, the cost of borrowing and the, if I hadn't done that, I could have made you, tortured you by making you go through a interest coverage ratio and a synthetic rating. But the end game here is the cost of capital. The cost of capital is 11.10%. I'm sorry, cost is 11.03%. For the software business, I think I gave you the beta for the software business below the Tesla regression beta. And, and 
I used that beta to come up with, and again, it's this isn't going to make or break this project, and that's why I'm not going to make an issue of it. But if this had been half of your revenues, then I'd have been much more stringent about saying, use the right discount rate for it's a riskier business. The cost of capital for the software business is 13.8%. Any questions on the cost of capital calculation? Yeah. Company. Do you think that it's fair to compare this robot company with, I don't know, more in, more stable industrial companies like a lot of so you, but, a, a lot of companies are right. very different. Okay, so let's stay on that. Let's assume, remember I said, don't go out of the case, right? So in a sense, you were, not, so if you were going to go to capital IQ, you could have come up with a replacement group. And one reason I decided not to let you do it, it's like mutually assured destruction, because if you leave the case and start collecting information, next thing you know, you're going to be collecting information outside. But you could take the sample that I gave you and said, I'm going to look at only the large market cap companies in that sample, because this company, Tesla, in this, in this group is going to be a larger player. It's perfectly okay, but there's a trade-off, right? You get companies more like your company, but what do you lose? You have smaller numbers. If you still end up with 15 companies, you're probably going to be okay. But if you end up with only five companies, I don't think the trade-off is working in your favor. So it depends on how stringently. So if you decide to use a subset of those companies to come up with the beta for your company, I'm perfectly okay with it. But just make sure that there's enough numbers there still to get the law of large numbers working. Implicitly, for this project, doesn't the beta seem low? It's a machinery business, right? Robotics, which is, you know, you have minds. Uh, so in a, in a sense, the question you got to ask is, what is it going to be driven by? It's going to be pretty close. Every, every, every company, in a sense, at some point, some part of the business is going to be mechanized. And if your clientele is across the market and they're all buying robots for different parts, wouldn't you pay to kind of move towards one? I mean, a business to business company that caters to businesses across the spectrum, should expect to see its beta pretty close to the beta of the market because your clientele is spread across the market. I don't see anything intuitively about this, which would lead me to think that the beta will be high. Maybe what you're thinking about is maybe the life of this project is going to be questionable because technology could shift. Who knows what the next generation of robots is going to look like and who's going to make it. That doesn't fit easily into a discount rate. That is a life and that, there you might say, look, I went with a 10-year life precisely because I don't trust this net present value that comes from extending the life. One final question about betas. I gave you a lot of extraneous information, right? I gave you a beta for Tesla. I gave you betas for other businesses. I wanted to see how many of you would waste your time computing weighted average betas across multiple businesses. Not because I want to torture you, but it's a lesson that you will remember for the rest of your life. Because when you're looking at a project, what the heck are you doing distracting yourself by bringing in seven other businesses that have nothing to do with the project? So it's a half a point, but the memories will last forever, hopefully. No, it's something to remember. A project's risk should drive its discount rate. Don't get entangled in doing weighted average betas. You're not computing a cost of capital for Tesla, the company. You're computing a cost of capital for this specific project. Uh, incidentally, the equity risk premium comes from where? Not the US, even though it's a US company, it comes from where you get your revenues. So robots are going to be sold primarily in, let's say, Europe, because Asia has a lot of cheaper labor and they prefer that. You will end up with a beta that reflects where your revenues come from. So that's why equity risk premiums for projects can vary for different projects, depending on, you know, in fact, you could argue that for the Disney theme park in Rio, I should have used a Latin American equity risk premium rather than a Brazil risk premium, because you could, you know, your, your, the people coming to the theme park come from all over Latin America. So I, with each step, I'm going to show you the distribution of what you found as cost of capital. There were two groups that had cost of capital less than 10%. And my guess is that's because book debt ratio is something. There were a couple of groups where there's one group with a cost of capital greater than 13%. The median is like, you know, pretty close to mine, 10, 10 and a half, you know, 11%. So you're pretty close to that, that man. And the differences might come from how you computed your beta and how you ended up 
you know, coming up the cost of capital. But in the cost of capital, there isn't that much room to run for this particular project. Now, of course, half-heartedly, I did the return on capital. Why? Because I know I'm not going to use it. So it's almost like by road. I want to see what the return on capital is. But there are a couple of things I had to factor in. One was, you know, if you if you look at the at the revenue, should I compute the return on capital with the software revenues or just do it for the project? I decided to include the software revenues and look at it without. I also had to decide what to include in my capital, and I included both the investment in fixed assets and machinery and factories, as well as working capital. And if you look at the return on capital, the return on capital I get, if you look at the average, is about 28%. But the reason the average is so high is as you go through time, you can see the return on capital is climbing to almost 128% by the time you get to your 10. Why? Because in the finite life case, and I want to emphasize that, my capital invested is dropping over time because I'm depreciating assets. The asset base is getting smaller. My return on capital is climbing. Now, I got a couple of questions about should I do a geometric average rather than arithmetic average because that allows for it. There's a much simpler solution. When your return on capital is changing over time and the big numbers at the end are pushing your return on capital up, instead of looking at the average, take the aggregate, add up your operating income over the entire period, add up the invested capital over the entire period. That aggregated number, in my view, is a much cleaner measure of return on capital because it's like a weighted average. It takes into account when you make your money and how much is invested over the lifetime. And on return on capital, there's a huge amount of variation across the groups. There were a couple, you know, at least three groups of the return on capital was less than 5%. And at the other extreme, there were about four groups of the return on capital was greater than 20%, but a huge amount of variation between almost 0% and 30% on the return on capital. And you know why, right? Because it's driven by accounting choices. I mean, if you allocate something, the return on capital is going to be affected. How you depreciate things is going to affect your return on capital. So much more variation that's almost to be expected on return on capital because you're more discretion. Any questions on the return on capital calculation? Now, you're saying if you didn't intend us, intend us, you could have used return on capital. I didn't stop you from doing it. I'm not using it because I don't like it. But if you are an accountant at heart and you can't let go, I feel sorry for you, but you've got to hang in there. And you might say return on capital is what I'm going to use. No. So the reason I want to do it is to show how accounting choices affect. Let's talk about the finite life case, the 10-year case. Yeah. The $2 billion in money spent on R&D has already been spent. It's a sunk cost. But I also said it was expensed. What was the significance of that word? It's expense, not only does it sort of sunk cost, you don't have to worry about the things like depreciation that we had. It's to make your life easier. For some of you, I actually made your life more difficult. It was unintentional, but the expense was there saying, don't worry about it. That was the subtext to that thing, is it's been spent. No point worrying about it. You're not going to get it back. On the distribution system, the, the, the battery capacity that you're using, and this, I think, I want to spend a little time on because it goes to the heart of this notion of, an, of, of what happens if you take the premium. We talked about the incremental effect. I am going to count the fact that I have to invest in year three. I invested a year ahead of when my capacity ran out simply because I didn't wait till the last moment. But we did in year four, I fully understand. So I counted that as a cost. But I also counted the fact that if I invest in year three, I'm saving myself an investment in, I think, year eight that I'd have to make anyway. I'd have run out of capacity anyway. The two questions you ask is, what will happen if I take the project? What will happen if I don't take the project? What will happen if I take the project? I invest in year three. What will happen if I don't take the project? I'll invest in year eight. That difference is what's going to affect your net present value because this assigning the cost in year three and not bringing in the savings you're going to get in your head is incomplete, right? You asked half the question, but where's the other half? So that's, it's again, it's not going to make, make or break your valuation. It's a half a point in terms of points, but it's really about be, you know, asking the question, making sure it's complete. And since the project is going to be wrapped up at the end of 10 years, 
I not only have to salvage what's left of my fixed assets, but all the working capital that I've invested, I'm going to collect back at book value. And we talked, Dora and I, you know, we talked about why book value. I could have said my working capital is worth half a book value, and I'm okay with that as long as you tie up the loose end, which is what? If you salvage working capital of fixed assets less than book value, then you got to deal with the tax consequences. If you show me these are the tax savings I would get by doing it, I'm okay with that. Here, I'm going to save myself the trouble, and you're going to see a salvage. So let me focus in the, on this expansion investment because it seems like I'm nitpicking and I might be in terms of numbers, but I want to go through the logic. What will happen if I take the project and I run out of capacity in year four? I spend 2,154 million, which is the 2,000 million growing at the inflation rate, and I depreciate the straight line over 20 years. Why 20 years? If you did 10 years, that's perfectly okay. You make your choice. It doesn't make that much of a difference. So that's what will happen if I take the project. What will happen if I don't take the project? I was going to run out of capacity anyway in year nine. I'd have invested 2,498 million in year nine, and I'd have depreciated that two straight line. So what is the effect of taking the project? It's the difference between the two. It's this the present value of spending earlier rather than later. It's still going to cost me in terms of NPV. It's just not costing as much as we did. And the depreciation benefits start earlier. So in a, there's some offsetting effect from investing earlier. So I'm bringing that net effect into the cash flows. And what it shows up as is extra depreciation in the first five years. And then the two years where I've done you know, invested anyway, I actually get less depreciation because I've read way. So it's almost like you played through both sides and see the difference. So again, it's not this case, but whenever you have an incremental effect, go through the full set of sequence, the full sequence of what will happen if I take the project, what will happen if I don't take the project. Any questions on that? Yes. When do you run out of capacity? Year 10? Year 9? Year 9. Okay. Percent a year, that's 40, 44, 48 point four. Yeah. Yeah, which is what I, and so I'm I'm off by four to by 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 little. But do I still do you still run out in your nine with the ten percent? Your ten? Okay. Your nine. Per perfectly okay. So I probably screwed up and used to slightly higher growth rate in battery. So yeah. So here are my incremental cash flows. I did it the long way. I did the operating profit as the accountants who did it. And remember, there are two items here that are a, a bit of an issue. One is that allocated GNA, right? Which is the accountant's way of dealing with GNA. And I gave you the incremental GNA. In my initial accounting, I stayed with the allocated GNA, thought like an accountant, came up with operating income, netted out taxes. What am I implicitly assuming that Tesla is going to be able to do in years one, two, and three? Even that they're going to be able to take the losses on this project and claim it against profits elsewhere. I mean, I gave you the income statement of Tesla. You can actually check to see whether they're making money and clearly they are already. So I use the marginal tax rate, but I'm willing to accept the effective tax rate. The argument might be that they have NOLs carried forward. Maybe they can have a lower tax rate. I'm perfectly okay with it. Just think through it and explain that's what you did. So you get after tax operating. Then I add back depreciation, which you always do. What's this fixed allocated, what's the, what's the extra 32 million? Their allocated GNA is 158 million. What was the incremental GNA? I think it was 200 million. So there's an extra 42 million that I'm missing, right? So how come I'm adding back only 32 million? That 42 million is tax deductible. You take one minus the tax rate. I'm effectively counting the after tax amount because everything is an after tax term. So I'm basically making my allocated GNA into incremental GNA with this extra adjustment. CapEx, there are 20 billion, nothing following. You're saying, why aren't you putting in maintenance? Because I plan to run the project for only 10 years. Why the heck would I be maintaining things if I'm essentially milking the project for its cash flows? There's a 2154 in year three, 2498 in year eight or nine, depending on which year you put it in. And then there's a change in working capital. 
the change in working capital, I said, is percentage of revenue. You can compute the change in the, the total working capital. But please don't subtract out the total working capital. If you did, that might explain why you got this huge negative net present value. Because if you subtract out the total working capital every year, you know what you're doing? You're investing double, tri triple, the same amount over and over again. It's a change in working capital. Why is there a change in year zero? What does the working capital bullet say about when you invest? It starts, it's at the start of the year. The start of year one is right now. That if I'd said the end of the year, the whole thing would have been moved over a year. It's the start of the year. And what is this minus 1871? That is my salvage value being collected of working capital. That minus of a minus becomes a plus. So that adds to my cash flows in year 10. Nice thing about finite life projects is you tie up the loose ends, you end the project, and you can compute the net present value. Now, that was starting with accounting numbers and fixing things. And you can see the pain in the neck, right? You forget to do the one minus T. So if you want something more direct, you can just do the incremental cash flows directly. What does that mean? The only difference here, instead of subtracting out allocated GNA, I just subtract out the incremental GNA, and you get exactly the same cash flows. So you can go either way and on the, on the quiz, and this is a good thing to remember, is you can do it the long way by doing the operating income and cleaning up. But if you're asked for incremental cash flows on the quiz, just I think this is a much more direct and cleaner way. You're less likely to make mistakes on what to add back, what to subtract out, what to after tax. So the, the effect is the same, the same cash flows. So here's my net present value in the finite life case. I took the cash flows from TBOT, discounted them at the 11.03% cost to capital that I estimated for the Tesla bot project. I get net present value of minus 6 billion. I take the incremental revenues from, from software, take the operating income on it because it's not the revenues that are the cash, cash flows, the operating income. There's no depreciation capex to worry about. It's incremental. You discount them back at the 13.8% cost to capital software the net present value you get is 22.95. You sum up those two, the cumulative net present value in the finite life case is about minus 3.7 billion. So the project doesn't look good on a 10 years. For the nature you are generating the first years. What, what, take, take a look at this. What am, what am I doing? It's like you're creating a bigger flows like the, the beginning years no no wait if you have a loss on a project you don't carry it forward why would you what do you do as a company you have money losing projects you have money making projects so what do you do with the loss on a project but in real terms that's deferred tax assets there's no deferred ta not on a project companies don't keep track of deferred taxes on projects it make no sense right you have 100 projects 10 are losing money 90 are making money you're not allowed to create a deferred tax as a liability just on the 10 projects. If you as a company, you're losing money. Yeah. So when you have individual projects, it actually makes far more sense to take the benefit right away rather than, I mean, I could take, if this had been a standalone project, play out, what would I have done? I'd have taken the loss, shown zero taxes in year one, zero taxes in year two, zero taxes in year three, and then in years four, five, and six, that I've used the NOLs to protect myself against taxes, I'd get exactly the same nominal tax benefit, but the present value of my tax benefits will be lower because I have to wait longer to get it. And that's why it always makes sense to take the tax benefit right away. You know, if I wanted to be tricky, I could have given you Tesla's income statement. If this were three years ago, you know what, what you'd have seen there, right? You'd have seen losses. And then I could have thrown the NOL is 4 billion and seen if that changed the way you do things because it should, right? Because the company is losing money and it's got NOLs. You're not going to be able to get this immediate tax benefit, which is nice to get. So now let's, let's look at, yeah. Why are you not taking the, the additional DNA uh, and subtracting that from the net income? I am, right? What do you mean? Uh, in the first yeah, case, I am. You're taking the allocated DNA, but you're not taking the incremental DNA. No, the incremental, the, if you add those two numbers up, I'm going to come up with the incremental. I can't count both the incremental and the allocated in the same thing because 
you know, that would make no sense. You either allocate something, or you take the incremental amount, adding them to, which just means I'd have a much bigger add back. So if you had a bigger GNA because you included the two and you added back the total effect, you'll get end up with the same cash flows that I do, but you got there with the circuitous route because you, you essentially counted both as part of your GNA. I counted only the allocated GNA when I did the operating income. And all I had to do then is look at the difference between the allocated and the incremental not the total incremental, because ultimately I want to subtract out 200 million, right? And I want to get there. I'm just getting there by taking the 158 million first, the allocated GNA and say, I've missed an extra 42 million. I'm going to bring it in. And that's the 32 million you see there is a 42 million net of taxes. You multiply by one minus the tax rate. Why is it just 42 million? Because the case is in addition to the allocated, Tesla will impact 100 million extra. It's, it doesn't say in addition. It says it will allocate. It gives you both the allocated amount and the incremental amount. Would, who does the allocated amount? The accountant does it. It's entirely an accounting ploy, right? So if you want to include both as your GNA and subtract both out, that's fine. But then you would be adding back the entire allocated GNA. And you know what the net effect is going to be? exactly the same. So if you subtracted out 358 million as your GNA and added back one, you know, whatever, 158 million times one minus the tax rate, you'll end up with exactly the same cash flows. I've just chosen to take the allocated GNA because I'm thinking like an accountant who doesn't care about incremental stuff, I've chosen the allocated. But if you did the total amount and added back the entire allocated GNA, you'll get exactly the same end result. Yeah which is what I did in the incremental case, right? Which is what I do, which is if you do the direct incremental, you just go with incremental GNA, then you don't have to do this cleaning up at all. So here's what your net present values look like. Six of the groups ended up with positive net present values. 22 had negative net present values. Okay. So most of you found negative net present values of the finite life case. Some had very, very big negative net present values, some smaller, but you can see the distribution. So most of you, if you'd stopped with the 10-year life, would have told me not to accept the project. And the six got positive net present values. The question is, what is it that they see in the project? What did they bring in that may... Some might be if you used a 9% cost of capital rather than 11% cost of capital, and NPV is going to reflect that. So my, some of this might just be the fact that, some, that a few of you got much lower cost of capital than mine. Now let's talk about the longer life case. I did go with the perpetual life, but as I said, I gave you this choice. I, as I was looking through, I think I saw three groups use 20 year lives rather than perpetual. So they add an extra 10 years. I think that's perfectly reasonable. And the rationale you'd give is, this is a business where change is happening rapidly. I'm not gonna assume things happen forever. So, but here's what I did differently in the longer life case. And when do I make this decision of finite, or perpetual life. Can I wait till the end of year 10 and say, you know what, I'm going to run this project forever. That's like following a diet of eating 15,000 calories a day until you're 65 and waking up and say, I want to be at my perfect fighting weight or walking weight, living weight or whatever weight you are at 65. It's too late. You're like the whale, right? I mean, basically you've seen the movie, right? I mean, essentially you can't wait till the end of year 10. This is not a probabilistic event where somebody tosses a coin at the end of your turn and say, if it comes up heads, you go on. And if it comes up tails, you end the project. So I have to manage this project differently right from the beginning. What does that mean? Remember in the finite life case, there was no capital maintenance. Here I introduce capital maintenance and the mechanics of what I do is not relevant. You could have had a very different capital maintenance, but what I'm looking for is, are you treating the perpetual life project differently and managing the project differently? So I started by, by setting the capital maintenance to 80% of depreciation in year one, because everything is still new. I don't have to have as much and building it up over time. But remember, if I'm counting on inflation to help me on the good stuff, revenues and operating income, it's also going to get in the way. When I do capital maintenance, I'm not going to be able to replace a machine from 10 years ago with a machine today of equivalent cost without paying more. So what you're going to see is my capital maintenance start to get larger and larger relative to depreciation as you go through time. Not because I'm buying more machines, but because inflation is having its insidious effect. So you're going to see that. Second, 
those expenses like advertising, GNA and are going to keep going, right? You can't just stop in your tent. And third, I can't salvage things. You can't stop at the end of your tents. I'm going to collect all my working capital and keep going because you can't have your cake and eat it too. And I will at least for the moment assume the synergy benefits continue in perpetuity. So let's see what the incremental cash flows look like here. It looks very similar until I get to after tax operating income. But here's the big difference. If you look at CapEx, there is that initial CapEx, but you start to see additional CapEx. So if you compare the two, and I'm actually going to focus in on just that comparison, what's different about the longer life case is I'm treating it as a longer life project. I'm putting money back into the project to keep it going. And the cash flows are therefore going to be lower for the first 10 years than they were in the finite life case. You know, one, one way of uh, thinking about this is, is, is to compare the cash flows, and I'll come back to it. But there's one final loose end here, right? In the finite life case, at the end of year 10, I stopped the project, I salvaged everything. That was easy, just book value. Here, I've got to decide what happens at the end of year 10. And here are your choices. You can say that my project continues for a finite period, an extra 10 years, in which case you take the present value of an annuity or a growing annuity and call that your terminal value. You can do what I did, which is essentially treat it as a perpetuity. And to value that perpetuity, I need a cash flow in your level. If you're going to do terminal values, please do not take your year 10 cash flows, put in a 2.5% growth rate on it and compute terminal value. I've seen analysts do this in valuation. It's one of the most dangerous things you can do because you're year 10 might have been doing things that reflected what your growth rate and characteristics were as a year 10. So you have 8% growth in year 10, and you were reinvesting on that basis. And then you take those cash flows and you grow them at 2.5%. You're building in things into that 2.5% cash flow that really don't match that growth rate. And I'll talk about the kinds of assumptions you have to make in year 11 to match your growth rate assumption. So I always explicitly do that extra year. I call it my terminal year. I make assumptions that year that I can live with forever. That cash flow is what I use to compute a terminal value. And it's the elephant in the room, right? $42 billion. If I just replace my salvage value with that terminal value, if I left my cash flows fixed, you know what's going to happen to my net present value. It's always going to go up. If I followed that logic, no project should ever have a finite life. Because why would you end the project? Replace salvage value, terminal value. No project would ever end after year four. So what I'd like you to think about is the trade-off here as to why most projects are finite life projects. Because to extend a project, you have to accept a trade-off. And the trade-off is you accept lower cash flows while you run the project. Why? Because you're putting money back in the project in return for a higher cash flow at the end of your time. Will that always Increase your net present value? Of course not. In many projects, you might decide it's not worth it, which is the reason projects sometimes end, you know, most projects end in year five, year 10. You don't keep every project going forever. In this case, it does increase net present value, but not by as much as you would get if you ignored that cash flow effect for the first 10 years. Now, obviously, the difference in cash flows you get will be different depending on how you assumed capital maintenance, but what I'm looking for is, are you making a different set of assumptions about capital maintenance with the longer life than with the finite life? Because that to me is, all, is, is, is really the big takeaway from this. You cannot keep your cash flows the same for the first 10 years. Just change the term, swap out the salvage value, the terminal value, because the end result then is predictable. Your NPV will just explode on you. So my NPV, so if you remember, it was minus 6 billion becomes less negative, minus 3.7 billion. So there was a benefit here. In this case, that suggests that Tesla should manage the project right from the beginning as a longer life project. There's, a, there's actually a decision variable that's coming out of this. It's telling me how to manage this project. And if I bring in the software, I'm getting tantalizingly close to a net present value of zero. You know why I say that, right? Somebody at Tesla, is probably an advocate for this project. They want this Tesla bot thing. They love those Tesla bots. And the advocates are the ones who always push the project forward. They're often the ones doing the cash flows. So let's say you're the advocate for Tesla. You've done this on your computer. Tomorrow is the presentation day. Are you going to be a little tempted? I mean, clearly there are a few numbers you can move around and the minus 
145. You are going to be tempted to kind of, you know, I, let, I used a 20% market share. Why don't I just make it 25% or let's make it a little 30%. And this is how you get on that slippery slope of, hey, let's push this project from negative to positive. And here's your perpetual life NPVs. And you can see they just explored out. There was one NPV for 192. I don't even know. There were so many zeros, I just lost track. I think it was this must have been a typo, I hope. You know. But clearly, there were some very, very large NPVs. And my guess is much of that is coming from the fact that you're keeping your first 10 years fixed and just change swapping out salvage stuff. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll wager that 75% of the groups, that's going to be the case. I'm not going to make or break you based on that, but that's something to think about is when you do valuation and capital budgeting, think through the consequences of what that effectively means. In fact, you take the change in NPV that you got. I think my change was $200 billion and your changes were in the thousands or $200 million. Your changes were in the billions, 2 billion, 3 billion, 5 billion, 7 billion, 10 billion. And you should always, whenever you see a net present value change, just because somebody's extending life out, you should get suspicious because you're saying, what am I missing here? If it's that easy to increase net present values, every project, you just have to extend the life out. There has to be a trade-off. What is that trade-off? Any questions on the longer life case? Yes. I have a question on the CapEx appreciation on year 11. Yeah. Maybe this will answer it. I was going to say is, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Okay. So he, here's how to think about CapEx versus depreciation. This is not just for projects. It's true for valuation as well. If the project ends, salvage value. Nothing to worry about. You're done. If the project continues, but you put in a growth rate of zero, I'd require you to put in a growth rate equal to the inflation rate. You chose to do that. But if you decided not to do that and you said my growth rate is 0%, remember you're actually shrinking the project in real terms, then it's okay to set capital maintenance equal to depreciation because your project is actually going to get smaller over time. And a, G and a growth rate of zero basically reflects the fact that you're okay with it. If you set the growth rate equal to the inflation rate, capital ma maintenance has to be greater than depreciation because you can't, you know, and this is the pushback against analysts who often offset it saying, it's just the inflation rate, what's the big deal? You still have to replace older equipment with newer equipment, capital. What if you'd set the growth rate greater than 2.5%? I don't know whether any of your groups did this. Any of you use a growth rate greater than the inflation rate? If you do you got a capacity problem. You know what, why there's a capacity problem? Because then you're selling more robots, not just raising the price at the inflation rate. And I'm okay with that, but then what do I need to see? I need to see investment in new capacity. Repeat it. So I'm not constraining you in what you can do after your 11, but I'm constraining you to be consistent in your assumptions about growth and what you assume about capex and depreciation after that. So save this table because it's going to come in useful if you're in valuation when you look at you know, year 11, year five assumptions, are the assumptions consistent? This is a way of working through whether you've got consistent assumptions. So let's see what you found. The reason I've crossed it out is I put the presentation together at 9.30 and four more reports came in. So I've crossed out the 28, made it 32, 17 and replaced with 18. And so it's 18 and 14, 18 of the groups that accept the project, 14 said reject. And I know because I've already looked at some of your reports and your conclusions, at least four or five had this conditional acceptance. And I'm going to push back on that. You know, the conditional acceptance is, right? If the project has a 10 year life, you know, reject the project, the project has a longer, no, no, you can't do that. This is not a probabilistic statement. It's a deterministic statement, which is you get to decide how to run the project. So you can't say, I'm going to run it like a 10 year project and then convert to, so you decide upfront. So if you think that the, that the long-term project has a positive net present value, say, I will accept, and I will then behave consistently with that assumption of longer life. There's no having your cake and eating to reject and accept. You know, it's, it's like people saying in a positive scenario, accept the project, in a negative scenario, reject the project. It's kind of meaningless to say that. 
So don't go back and rewrite your report. I will not, but, but try to avoid when you look at, at, at statements like these, you know, what's the old, you know, the old Spider-Man line with great power comes great responsibility. Now, you have a lot of power. You played all with all these tools. Ultimately, you are responsible for carrying the tool and saying, this is my decision. And if you're a believer in crowd wisdom, I just took all of your numbers and averaged and aggregated them. And you can see there are some outliers in this game. And as, as I said, I don't know where the outliers are coming from. Maybe you had an extra zero in your revenues. You know, I'll check your numbers. You know, but get my guess, it's some math error that went through and, and magnified. But here's what I want you to think about. The 18 groups that chose to accept the project. I want you to think about what will keep you up at night, right? There's a $20 billion investment you made. And what are the things that will keep you up if you accept the project? Let's go down the list. One is, will people actually use robots as much as we thought they would? I mean, still, you know, we don't know how robots like this excitement about chat GPT, will it actually take over the world? Second, you worry about low cost robots in every business with a lot of promise, you have a company like Tesla start and there's a Chinese compared who starts and produces those robots at half cost. You worry about competition. What will that do to our margins? But the things you worry about are the things that essentially you took as expectations of what could go wrong. And you don't, you shouldn't stop with the worry. You should do something about it, right? So if you're thinking about, hey, my cost structure might get me into trouble, you want to do things that bring your cost structure under control. And if you reject the project, what keeps you up at night? First, you don't lie awake at night as much. Now do you see why managers tend to be risk averse? It's better to reject something than to accept something because you never get fired 10 years after the fact. You seldom get fired because of an opportunity lost. People write terrible things about you. Survival often drives managers towards rejects, even though the numbers say, you know, might say take the project. But if you do reject the project, what you might regret is 10 years later, you look back and the robotics business is a trillion dollars. And you had a chance to get in on the ground floor and say, I wish I'd done that. I mean, that's what traditional automobile companies did 10 years after Tesla came and said, I wish we'd done that and not waited for them to eat our lunch. So any questions on the case? So here's what will happen. I will... Oh, there's one more statistic, 22 and 10. Remember I said put Tesla bought in the subject? 22 of you did, 10 of you did not. I will find the 10, but I'll be really pissed by the 10. No, I won't take it out on you. But the reason I did that, I counted. I got 387 emails yesterday. And I try to keep up all through the day, but things slip away. So... I will have to have, do a search and find mission if you did not use Tesla bot in your subject. So on the next round, when I ask you to use something in the subject, it's not because I'm trying to be picky. It's because it goes into a smart mailbox that looks for that name. You know? So try to do this, especially in the final project, because that's going to be a day when I get you know, 350 projects from my undergraduate class, you know, who God only knows how many will come in together at the same time. So, but I will start grading the projects in the order that I got them. And I, before I do that, after class today, I will actually send you a grading template with these codes on. So you forgot to put in the reinvestment in year eight and you did only the year three, that's 3A. The reason I do it, when you get your grade back, it'll give you a grade and it'll give you, these are the things I found in your project. 3A, 9C, your grade is eight and a half. And I might screw up and I might have missed something that you actually did. So if I've done it, just come back to me. But I will CC everybody in the group when I return the project. And that's why when you send the project in, I said, you know, CC everybody in the group. So when I re respond, everybody gets a graded project back at the same time. And I won't start grading till five o'clock today because I have to teach till five o'clock. I find it difficult to both grade and teach at the same time. Maybe one of these days I can figure out a way to do it. So you'll start getting the projects back this evening, spilling over into tomorrow. And hopefully by midday tomorrow, you should all have your cases back. Okay. 
Okay, so let's treat Tesla board as a sunk cost. And go back to the pack. Okay. So last loose sense in capital budgeting. We've talked about different ways of picking projects. Now how to pick between projects with similar lives and different lives. Yes. I think the two things that I use with the total market size and market share, everything else to me is less of an issue, right? I want to ask what if about risk-free rates. I ask no questions about cost of capital and risk-free rate because, you know, it's affecting everybody. It's affecting all my businesses. The two big numbers to me that I'm uncertain about are the numbers that I'll lie awake at night. So one way to do what if analyses is to put yourself in the position of I've accepted the project. What are the things that I would worry about the most where I can do something about it, right? So I think total market and market share would be the two numbers I would be most focused on because I would love to make the, the EBITDA margin go from 35 to 65%. But guess what? In the manufacturing business, it's not as if you have a whole lot of leeway to do that. So those would be the two numbers I would focus on. But if you do what if analyses, two suggestions. One is tie it to your final conclusion. So when you do a chart, say, this is what my net present value will be as a function of the market share. Rather than just say, look at figure three for that chart, say, when we made our decision, we decided not to accept the project, even though the net present value is marginally positive, because it looked too sensitive to what our market share would be. And we feel uncertain about the market share. So whatever, what if you do has to tie into your decision because that's the only way it actually has some meaning in the analysis. So the last part of what I want to do here is the side costs and side benefits. And some of what I'm going to do right now is going to come, become familiar because it's things you had to deal with in the case. Okay? When you are a company taking a project, Disney building a theme park, you almost never start from scratch. You know what I mean by that? Where you hire fresh people and bring in fresh resources. You borrow resources. You take resources you already own and often use them on a project. And they, it looks free, right? I already own. The, the person already works for me. So one of the things I want to talk about are the side costs that you face as a company because you've used up resources on a project. Like what? Like a capacity that to manufacture batteries, excess capacity used it, no cost right now, but a potential cost in the future. And of course, projects can also have side benefits. We're talking about Disney, you know, the side benefits, right? I mean, you put, put out Mandalorian 3, there's merchandising that comes with it. There's additional spin-offs you can do it and maybe a game you can create around it. So the side costs and side benefits, and we can't just talk about them. We've got to bring them into the analysis. So let's first talk about this notion of an opportunity cost. What does that mean? When you use a resource that you already own, even though you already own it, you got to play it through and say, what will happen if I don't take this project to that resource? Maybe you'd sell it, maybe you'd rent it out, maybe you'd use it elsewhere. And you got to bring in that cost into your project. So let's say you have a resource that you were planning to sell, that now you have a project, you decide to use that resource instead. You know what you've given up. You've given up what you'd have made by selling that asset and the cash flow you'd have collected. Maybe you plan to rent or lease the asset. Now you can't rent or lease it out to somebody else because you've chosen to use that asset in this project. Or maybe this asset could have been used elsewhere in your company. And now because you've used up the capacity, when that need comes about, you got to spend more money. So in every case, you got to think through what are the consequences for the company from taking this project because they've used a resource already. So let's take the, the first case. Let's assume that Rio theme park is going to use land that Disney already bought. It's undeveloped right now, but, uh, but that land can be used for the offices for Rio Disney. If Rio Disney is not taken, the land can be sold for 40 million. The land was actually bought several years ago for 5 million. Real estate prices have gone up. So if you look at the balance sheet for Disney, you're going to see 5 million is the book value of the land, but you can sell it right now for 40 million. So you can do this in your head. So when I'm doing my Rio Disney theme park, what is the opportunity cost of using this land for the theme park? Seems simplistic, 
First side, you're saying it's a 40 million. First, it's never the book value, right? You really don't care what the book value is. You can allocate it. You can reallocate it. Nobody cares. It's a cash flow effect. It's 40 million. But what am I missing if I stop at 40 million? There's a capital gain. And how would I compute that? 40 minus 5 times 0.2, which would be 7 million. 40 million minus 7 million is 33 million. I'm going to show it as part of my initial investment. So when you look at the initial investment for your Disney, you're going to see 33 million. And I'm going to call it opportunity cost of land. And even if the person pushes back things, we already own the land. My response is, this is what you're giving up by using the land on this project. So let's take a second case. Let me go back to that bookscape, independent bookstore. This is way back in time. And they did not have an online retail site because they traditionally sold books from people coming into the store. They've decided that they're going to create an online retail site that they can sell books. It's going to cost them a million dollars up front to set this up. And here's what's going to happen. It's expected to have a life of four years. You're going to depreciate the million down to no salvage value. And the revenues in the first year are expected to be a million and a half from the online bookstore. And it's going to grow 20% a year in year two and essentially continue through the end of year four. You're saying what happened at the end of year four? You got to either renew the investment and continue again. New investments need to come in. But I want to look at this investment as a four-year investment. The employees that the online store is going to have, is going to have so 150,000 in year one, growing at 10% a year for the following three years. And the working capital, which includes the inventory of books, is going to be 10% of revenues. So essentially, it's a four-year project that a traditional bookstore is taking in the online retail space. Let's look at what the cash flows look like. Before we do the cash flows, first, I've got to come up with a cost of capital. Right? Now, we have a cost of capital for Bookscape who already computed that that was a traditional bookstore. So following the same script that I did for Tesla Bot, which is, hey, the discount rate for a project should reflect the risk of the project. I looked at the debt to capital ratio, the beta, essentially of the online retail business, use that to come up with the cost of capital, which is actually much higher than my cost of capital that I compute for Bookscape because it's a riskier business. I know it's like a, I'm a broken record. I keep talking about project discount rates because as, as I said, this is a mistake that I see companies making over and over using one hurdle rate across the board. And here I'm arguing for a higher discount rate because it's much riskier, 18.12% discount rate. I'm still staying with the total beta. Why? Because it's still a privately owned bookstore. The owner is not diversified. But the discount rate I have, I think the, the cost of capital for uh, Bookscape we had, even with the total beta, the old bookstore was 10.3%, but I'm using the 18%. So with just the cash flows that I've projected out, the net present value that I get for the investment is 76 Point three uh, seventy six thousand three seventy five looks like a positive net present value. But if you're a small bookstore, you open an online space, you're going to be using up resources you already own as a bookstore. So let me bring in a couple of resources that I forgot to mention. The first is the manager you have for the bookstore is now going to be asked to also manage the online store. You think what's the big deal? Well, that's an extra responsibility and to kind of induce the person to do this. The same manager, you're going to offer them a $20,000 pay increase saying, you know what, you've got additional responsibilities. So that's because of the online store, you're going to offer a higher salary. And after the online venture, this is going to be tough to do, and you're going to bring the salary back down. We'll talk about whether that's even feasible because you might be locked in here but the extra 20,000 growing the inflation rate becomes additional salary. So that's an incremental cost. The second is there's an office that this bookstore has that's right now being used to store financial records that you're going to use as the office for the owner. Those records have to move elsewhere. So let's say it'll cost a thousand dollars a year to store them in a bank somewhere else or in a bank, you know, some kind of a storage space. So there are two incremental costs I did not factor in. My original NPV was 76,000. I want to see whether that's now going to change because I bring these two categories. So first I took the 20,000 in salary growing at the inflation rate. And I took the after-tax expense. Remember when I pay a salary, it's tax deductible. Everything is in after-tax terms. So the, that's the extra present value coming from the salaries. 
The storage cost of a thousand also tax deductible present value of an annuity one point one thousand six. You add those numbers to my net present value with the cost considered. The net present value still stays positive. Heave a sigh of relief because it could have shifted my decision. Here I've actually done the net present value in three parts. Right, I did the net present value for the project, and I did the net present value of the salary, the additional salary, and the net present value of the storage costs. Could I put them all into the same calculation? Yeah, in fact, I could have brought the cash flow it into the overall cash flows, done one net present value, and the answer I've got would have been exactly the same. And that's a great thing about NPVs, is they're additive. You know what I mean by that, right? If you break your cash flows down into two groups and you do the net present value of each group and add them up, as long as you use the same discount rate. Now do you see why I kept the synergy benefits separate from my... Tesla bought cash flows because I intended to use different discount rates. So the minute you bring in the synergies into your overall cash flows, you're in a sense trapped, right? You either have to use Tesla bots discount rate or some weighted average of Tesla bot and software, which is going to be a nightmare to compute because the weights are going to change. So if you have two sets of cash flows with different discount rates, it's better to keep them separate, do the net present values of each, and then add them up at the end rather than try to do a consolidated cash flow. To one final opportunity cost example. Let's assume in the Vale example, remember the iron ore mine, the firm will use an existing distribution system. So I'm going to be the advocate for this new mine. So I come to Vale and say, look, we already own that distribution capacity. There's no cost to us. You know how often managers make this argument within companies? We already own that. That person already works for us. It's basically free. So let's put that on the table. Nothing in business is ever free. There's always a cost. The question is, are you willing to bear up to that cost or not? So is it true that if I use excess capacity, it's free? The answer kind of should already be from what our Tesla bot discussion. Or why is using excess capacity not free? Let's work it through. What are the consequences of using excess capacity? One is that when you, you might have to invest earlier rather than later, right? So because you run out of capacity. The other is if you choose not to invest earlier, what, what's the other option? You can cut back on sales on your less profitable product. And so you might say, look, you know, I'm going to run out of capacity in year three. And after that, I'm not going to sell as many batteries. That's okay because I'm going to give up those sales. Again, this is not a probabilistic event. You don't wait till year three. So what do I do now? You look to see which one would cost you more money. Is it going to cost you more money to cut back on production? Or is it going to cost you more money to build excess capacity? And you're going to make the choice that's less expensive to you. So when you look at excess capacity, you always have to stop and ask the question, what do I do when I run out of capacity? In the case, I took that decision out of your hands because I said you have to invest. But companies never have to invest. They can choose not to invest. But in that case, you've got to factor in what would I have lost in terms of lost sales? from existing products? And is it worth using the excess capacity now? So any questions on opportunity costs? So as you look at companies, they're using existing resources, price them out. Look at what it's costing the company to use those resources. Those should become part of your decision-making. So for you coming back for MBAs, your opportunity cost is that you gave up salaries at wherever you were working. Another opportunity cost might have been that you lived in St. Louis, you're now living in New York, your, your expenses are 25% higher. I'm not trying to depress you and push up the cost of your MBA, maybe I am. I'm saying those are all opportunity costs that should go into this decision. It's too late for you now, but you know, of whether to come to business school. And those are costs that should be factored into decisions. Yes, any questions? There's one final point I yeah, want to make, and this is actually a hey, very- professor, Yes. If we can ask, what, have we switched uh, with- We're still on the wrap, we're still on the, the Zoom folks can only see the wrap up yeah. and summer, summary slide from the Tesla bot presentation. I don't know if, if we've gone back to the- I the should class. have switched, I'm sorry. Let me, let me switch. That's okay. Yes. And my video is not on either. Jesus, I really screwed up today. Thank you, professor, no worries.
now you can see this, this the right slide, right? Yes, yeah, we're good okay. to go now. Thank you. There's one final point, and this is a really tricky point where I don't have a clean answer. Take that Rio Disney numbers that I gave you, right? There's revenues and expenses, and I based it on the number of tourists that are going to come into the theme park. But would some of those tourists have come to a Disney theme park anyway? I mean, how long is the flight from Sao Paulo to Orlando? Probably not that much longer than flying within Latin America, long distances, right? So somebody in Colombia, it might be quicker to get to Orlando than to Rio, but some of those tourists in your Rio theme park would have been your customers anyway. You see where I'm going, right? If you use the concept of incremental, you might say, look, I should be counting only the tourists who would never have come to a Disney theme park who will now come to Rio Disney. And you can already see the impact of doing this. Instead of counting all of the revenues, you'll count only the 80% of the revenues coming from new users. What is that going to do? Holding all its constant. If you count in this cannibalization cost, which is what you're doing, it'll lower your revenues, lower your earnings, lower your cash flows, perhaps to a point where your theme park has a negative net present value. So you don't build a theme park. What will keep you up at night? You've decided not to build a theme park based on the fact that there's incremental revenues. What would you worry about? That Universal Studios will be, build a Rio theme park. And there are some people who will tell their kids, you know what? It's so much more convenient to go to Universal. It's got a lot of rides. I mean, it's going to be tough in the case of Disney to convince your kid that there is no mouse here or there are rats under the ground and you can watch them instead. No. But basically, the argument is if a competitor comes in and does this, you'd have lost sales anyway. Would you rather cannibalize yourself or would you rather have somebody else cannibalize you? Now do you see why there's a Starbucks every three blocks in New York City? It's a deadly business model because it's going to kill you in the long term, but you feel trapped. You're saying, I know there's another Starbucks three blocks away, but people are too lazy. If I don't build this Starbucks, Costa is going to open it. And people are saying, you know what? I like Starbucks, but I don't like walking two blocks. I'll go to the Costa instead. This is what drives businesses like Starbucks into destructive growth but you get trapped into it because you're saying, if I don't do it, I'm going to get cannibalized anyway. I don't have a solution to the problem. If you're in a business model where this has become the problem, you're going to open far too many stores because even though each store has a positive net present value, guess what's happening? There's a collective NPV across your stores that no longer makes sense. And every five or 10 years at Starbucks, they seem to come to this realization. And then they say, we're going to shut down 250 stores or 500 stores. But it's a model that's almost boom and bust because it's designed to do that. In the case of Disney, you could argue that they're so unique that those customers would come only to a Disney theme park, in which case you count only the 80%. You don't lie awake at night because you know those people are not going to a different theme park. But it does mean that companies that have strong competitive advantages, you know, proprietary advantages are less likely to make these expansion investments. And it has consequences in healthcare, right? If you are Bristol Myers and you own the largest ulcer drug on the market or GlaxoSmithKline, you have the largest ulcer drug in the market and your R&D department has come up with a better ulcer drug. It's kind of a, morbid example to go through. You know who's going to lose sales when that new drug comes out. It's going to be your, it's going to be your drug and you're going to hope, it's not that you will not develop the drug, but you'll wait longer to develop the drug. Perhaps 12 years into its patent, you wait and do it because then you can time the patents to get the extra life. So in those diseases where there's a single drug that dominates the market, you can almost see the pre prediction will be if the same company comes up with a better drug, it's less likely that you're going to see the drug hit the market quickly. If it's a different company that comes with the drug, all bets are off. So when you think about product cannibalization, think about how difficult it must be in the smartphone business or the computer business, right? When Apple introduces a new iPhone, and clearly the iPhone, nobody buys the iPhone 14 once the iPhone 15 comes out. 
you can't, if you just count the incremental amount, you're going to be in deep trouble. You'll never introduce a new device, right? So you can see this cannibalization issue playing out in decisions. And in comparative businesses, you're going to see companies look at the total cash flows and not look at the incremental cash flow because they're worried of getting cannibalized anyway. So the way Disney deals with cannibalization will be different in different businesses. In the theme park business, where the moat is incredibly high and difficult, I mean, moats can't be high, incredibly wide, and you can't cross them, then they can focus on incremental. In businesses like broadcasting, they got to be more careful because they decide to hold back Mandalorian 3 because, you know what, they said, look, 2024 looks kind of light. Let's move it to 2024. Let's wait. The worry is that people stop subscriptions and stop up. People will switch to Netflix. Your cannibalization will happen anywhere. So you can already see that the streaming business, this is another problem. Everybody's racing to get there because they can't afford to wait because there are so many streaming services competing for our attention that if they don't do it, it'll get done anyway. Now in the context of synergies, side benefits, Synergies can take lots of different forms. And as I said, Disney is a master at milking synergies. Okay. I mean, it's not just merchandising, it's a character dinners. I mean, I took my grand, you know, I, I think I mentioned it, took my grandson to Disney World two weeks ago. You can go to a character dinner, character breakfast. What do you get? Eggs and toast for $50. You say, well, why would I pay $50 for eggs and toast? Mickey might come by, might. Chip might come by instead. I want to see Mickey. No, whoever comes by is whoever you get, right? So, but you pay for it. That's synergy. You got to admire a company that can milk every conceivable side benefit you can get. Right? So that's what we talk about when we talk about synergies. It's uh, it, and with the, with Disney, you know, they own two Broadway theaters, right? So the movies create these side shows. You get Broadway shows. Those Broadway shows run forever because the tourist comes in with kids. They said, do you want to watch The Lion King or do you want to watch some serious show that you've never heard of? Parade. They say, Lion King, I've never heard of Parade. I don't even know what that is. No. It's, these shows run forever. Take a look at, you know, they run for 10, 12, 15 years. They're tourist perennials. So side benefits for Disney are part of the game. So when I look at a Disney movie, I can't just stop at gate receipts. I've got to bring in all those side benefits. And there are lots of Disney movies that crash and burn at the theater, but still provide enough side benefits that they're potentially going to be valuable. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about a couple of synergies. Now, let's go back to the bookstore. So let's suppose you are the owner of the bookstore, you see a Barnes and Noble open down and they have a cappuccino bar. You think, why does it matter if you're a serious reader? Because most people are not serious readers. They want a cappuccino, and if they feel really good, they might buy a book while they're there, right? So you decide that you want to add a cafe. And I'm going to give you the numbers for the cafe. The cafe by itself has a negative net present value. So if you gave me the cafe and you showed the, show the sales on the cafe, I think it's a minus 87 million. But let's say by adding a cafe, you're pulling people into the store who then in a moment of weakness, maybe you're dosing the cappuccinos with something that makes them buy books, you know, they go out and buy books. And let's assume it'll increase revenues by 500,000 in year one, growing at 10%. You see what the side benefit is, right? The extra cash flows you get, the net present value of those side benefits exceeds the initial investment. So this is all right. I mean, you go to independent strand doesn't do it because clearly I don't even know, you know what they expect you to do. It's so crowded, you couldn't build a cappuccino. But many independent bookstores tried to add other stuff because they felt it would attract people. By itself, the cafe doesn't make money, but it adds enough benefits that you're saying, you know, that that's a side benefit. And rather than just talk about it, you have to bring it into the cash flows. Let's complete that, that Tata Motors acquisition of Synergy. Remember, as a standalone investment, it didn't make sense. The value we got was 2.5 billion and the market cap was 5.2 billion. But the reason Tata Motors was buying Harman Audio is because they wanted to add better sound systems in their cars. And by doing so, do what? Hopefully be able to sell more cars. Let's suppose their objective is to do this with the only their Indian cars because Jaguar Land Rover already has sophisticated sound systems. Let's say it'll take three years for them to 
to bring in this technology. The reason I'm bringing in time is one of the things I mo find most troubling when people talk about synergy is they act like things happen instantaneously. You bring two companies together, next day the companies work as a team. I've seen companies come together, five years later, everything is still done in duplicate. I remember I used to teach for City Travelers Group and Solomon Brothers in the early 90s when I had to do the grunt work. And I taught them as three separate programs. And over the decade, you know what happened, right? They all became one company called City Group. And there were three separate training programs I was still teaching. And I wanted to teach three. I called the training person and I said, you know, I, you know, one company. I mean, why am I doing three separate training programs, the same program? They said, he, I rem still remember, this was four years after the merger. The trainer said, you know what? Uh, the city people don't like the travelers people. We can't put them in the same group. I said, this is what integration looks like. I knew then and there that this integration was going to go. It was a lot more rocky than they told the outside world. So it's going to be, take three years to bring this in. And when it does happen, let's suppose it generates 10 billion in after tax operating income in terms of additional cars sold. And the value of synergy can be computed, right? First, the synergy is almost entirely in India. So the equity risk premium I'm going to use is an equity risk premium in India. Right? Second, it, um, it, 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 the business we're talking about here is increased auto sales. Even though it's audio, it's going to a car, it's increased car sales. I'm going to use, go back to a beta for automobile companies. The reason I say this is remember the discount rate I used to value Harman Audio was based on the audio business and the electronics business. Now that I've made it part of a car and it's car sales that are driving synergy, I'm focusing on the risk of the automobile business. Dor? They do come together. That's actually a good question. Why do I have to buy an entire? Why did Disney buy Fox? because they wanted to control Hulu. And my reaction is, you did what to get what? You paid 70 billion to buy this monstrosity of a company that creates all kinds of consumer. Why don't you just go buy Hulu? And I think that's exactly the question we need to ask when you do acquisitions and you're going after a piece, you're saying, why are you buying an entire company? So that's actually a very good question that needs to be asked in acquisitions is why buy an entire company when all you're interested is 20% of the company or 15%? The answer might be the company will refuse to sell that unless you buy the company, but maybe you need to be willing to walk away. No, but, but to the extent that Harman requires some kind of role, maybe this is going to allow you to change the system so they adapt to your cars. So there might be a reason why you need to get ownership of it. But the net effect of this is the cost of capital that I will use will be based on an Indian equity risk premium. It's going to be an Indian rupees. It's going to be an automobile beta. And the synergy of value, and you could work it out, I think is 1.18 billion, even with this built in. That acquisition doesn't make sense. The point I'm making is don't let synergy become a plug variable explaining away why you want to do an acquisition. It's your job to put a dollar value in the number, bring it into the analysis and say, even with synergy, it is still a bad deal. And then you can look at options. Maybe there are other options which are cheaper. So I will see you on Monday. First 30 minutes is your quiz, right? There's no rest for the wicked. So work through, I mean, look at your case when you get it back because it's going to be relevant to the quiz. It doesn't make a material difference, but the, the personal expense, we put it in the first year and now we have like a year zero. Yeah. In the, in the, the, the sorry, investment, 20 billion, we put it in year one, year one, because it said that, it said that year zero, they, this year just ended, and the idea was you can't put it. doesn't make a material difference, but I just wanted to know the talk. With respect to the GN in the provinces, in addition to this, there is a 200 million GNA that has double been occurring. Yeah, I think it's a good thing. So then, uh, I was thinking uh, in the cash flow, wouldn't you just uh, kind of add back the allocated GNA and 
still expensive to get the next stock there no sir allocation it's still going to be so no matter how we do this transfer what you should end up with in your cash flow is an instrumental DNA. How do you get there? You the 158 added to the 300, so 338 many in the DNA that subtract out the 158 and you end up with one, right? So I took the 158 and then added back the extra 42 to get to one. Ultimately, that extra cash flow take is the trick. You want to get there. No matter what you put in the screen, you take the get there. You've got to get there. So if you subtract up more than 200 and then you have to be the cash flow, you have to be the cash flow. So the next thing is the second question was with respect to the prefix investment in GF2. Uh, the facility that we are adding. So uh, instead of like adding the full apex to the bond business and then depreciate cash flow, cash flow is a cash flow. You have to spend the money. Accounting can say only thirty percent goes to profit, but that's irrelevant, right? The accounting return on cap is in respect of the allocation of the so cash flow. It's a cash flow to the company, even though you're putting incremental cash flows. It's really the instrumental cash flows to the company and taking the profit. And guess what? No matter what you decide to allocate, you will be spending to an ad benefit in your business. But do we have to kind of put the full cash flow as part of the bot business uh, statement or like an instrumental cash flow? That's what I'm saying. In an instrumental cash flow, there is no notion of which business does it go to. There's only one pocket it comes out of, it's the company's pocket. Right. All of these cash flows are to the company. Now, I can take an expense and say, well, that's because of that. But that matters, right? I'm going to an That's my instrumental cash flow. And if you think about the net present value check, when you allocate things, you're trying to approximate that. So when you allocate things and you take instrumental effect and you're counting, if you don't do the instrumental effect, you're miscounting. So that's why it's better to work with the instrumental effect. Hi, Professor. Hi, how are you? Well, do you remember that we were talking about like for the nice of it's still the existing running? Yeah. 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 Yeah.